Hi everyone, my name is Julie and today we're traveling to the endless Eurasian steeps. We're going to explore the language of the nomadic people who were probably one of the most successful conquerors in history, San Manu, and welcome to the Mongolian language. Mongolian is the official language of Mongolia the country and of Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region in China. It's a bit tricky to say how many Mongolian speakers are there because it depends on how you count. Mongolian has a high variation in dialects. The biggest dialects are Khalkh and Horchin, spoken in Mongolia and Inner Mongolia respectively. Together with some smaller dialects, they constitute the Mongolian proper, with around 5 million speakers. Then the Ordos, Oirat and Urat are either considered separate languages or dialects of Mongolian, depending on who you ask. If you add them up, we'll get a total of 6 million speakers. By the way, I want to thank Skillshare for sponsoring this video. It's been over a month I'm exploring Skillshare and I've already learned so much. How to start a business, writing science fiction, digital illustration, how to speak on camera. This was a particularly useful one. Currently I'm doing the Creative Writing for All, a 10-day journaling challenge by Emily Gould, where you try to notice inspiration in your everyday life and transfer it into writing. I mean, whatever your creative aspirations are, whatever the skill you want to develop, you'll find it here. Provided by skilled mentors, ad-free, surrounded by a like-minded community. And the cherry on the top, the first thousand people to click the link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. Just dive in and explore your creativity. And then come back to this video. If there is one thing everybody knows about Mongolia, it's Genghis Khan. This undoubtedly great personality influenced history of the whole continent and also determined the development of Mongolian language. Before him, the so-called Proto-Mongolic was one of the many languages spoken in the steep. It had some relatives grouped into Paramongolic languages. Some of them even conquered and ruled parts of China. Now all what's left of them are records in Chinese historical chronicles, and some names. For example, the name of China in Russian is Kitai, which actually comes from Khitan. In the 12th century AD, Proto-Mongols were just another collection of nomadic tribes. It all changed when a new leader came, who gathered them and, short after, conquered almost all of Eurasia. And this is a new stage of Mongolian development, Middle Mongolian. It became a lingua franca in this new empire. Another major change to Mongolian made by Genghis Khan was his adoption of a script. The new Mongolian writing system was based on the Uyghur script, which itself could be traced all the way to Aramaic script. This writing, called Mongol Bichig, is written from top to bottom and from left to right, and it looks incredibly mysterious. But it's actually not that mysterious, because it's an alphabet. Just like the Latin alphabet, there are separate symbols for each sound, both consonants and vowels. There could be several versions of the same letter, depending on its position in the word, because you gotta connect those letters nicely. Mongol Vichik was not the only cool script created for Mongolian, there were so many. Fagspa, Soyombo, this very graphical horizontal square script. There is also the square version of the traditional script called the fold script and it can be found on Mongolian money. Time went by, centuries passed. Middle Mongolic spread across all Asia, but then started slowly dividing. Today there are four language families, descendants of Middle Mongolic the Mongolic itself, then the Gur, Shirongolic, and Mongol in Afghanistan, but which might be already extinct. Of all of these languages and language groups, Mongolic and Mongolian proper inside of it are by far the most numerous and healthy. There are some differences between the Mongolian in Mongolia and the Mongolian in China. The language norms are not the same in two countries. They are based on their dominant dialects, Khalkh in Mongolia and Horchin in Inner Mongolia. In the latter, they still write in this cool traditional Mongolian script, and as an oral norm, they use another dialect, Chakar, 
which is considered to be a bridge between Khalkh and Khorchin. In Mongolia, they use the Khalkh spoken in the capital, Ulaanbaatar, as their oral norm. And the traditional script has been replaced by something very familiar. 20th century Mongolian's People's Republic. As it is clear from the name, the state adhered to the communist regime, and its favorite communist friend was the Soviet Union. Under its influence, in 1940s, Mongolia changed its alphabet. After the fall of the USSR and the subsequent collapse of the communist regime in Mongolia, there were attempts to return to the traditional script, which were not successful, but still not abandoned. The current government plans to return to the traditional script by 2025, which is pretty soon, so let's see how it goes. The biggest issue that they need to solve is the support of the script by computer operating systems, as those have considerable issues processing vertical text. For now, the traditional script is used in Mongolia mostly for decorative purposes. For writing in the daily life, they still use the Cyrillic alphabet. Mongolian has a very high quantity and diversity of consonant sounds, but also some particularities. For example, Mongolian one of the rare languages that lacks sounds k and l, which are one of the most common sounds in other languages. And yeah, there is actually a letter k, but it's only used for loan words. The letter l stands for the th sound, where the l is pronounced with a blow of air from the mouth. That being said, in the Khorshin dialect of Inner Mongolia, there is a sound l. So when I say there is no sound l in Mongolian, that really depends on how you look at it. Those dialects. There are 13 vowel letters, but actually 7 vowel sounds. The other letters are used in diphthongs and suffixes. A very important pronunciation rule in Mongolian is that in the word, all vowels, except for the first one, get reduced to almost disappearing completely, like in Amarhan, Undeng, Shir. Exception is when a vowel is long, Bara, Khoshur, Shire. Because of this rule, you end up pronouncing only consonants almost, and that gives a very particular sound to the language. Nikturuzlu Urvil Chichon Uzikstein got the Yagota Tap Hunter bit of Jashnaho Tsagar, Facebook Amshi area, Bossy of Himich Gurupi, to do the sense of Chitu was of Chen. Here, Mitage and the Dreamans of Chita Damshi and Tatarha, Zulsig Mashkers, Hendrik of Chita, here, Mitage Hirigin, Gurupu, the Tandamsh and Zulsig Hendrik of Hus, Tosum, Medic Hiritir, Hus and Mutulus, Horizal. Not the Manas that could say Simarat Hermitage, a Yerara, in who group in Hitzaha. I was just not sure. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go to the house. i Let's see another rule. The seven vowel sounds in Mongolian are split into two groups, masculine and feminine, and one neutral. In one word, there could only be only masculine or only feminine vowels, and the neutral can go anywhere. That, by the way, doesn't affect the gender of a word. In fact, there is no such thing as grammatical gender in Mongolian. There are even masculine names with female vowels and vice versa. This rule is called vowel harmony, and if you speak a Turkic language, then you know exactly what it is. And this is not the only feature that Mongolian shares with other languages. This is the Altaic language family. To be more precise, there is no yet consensus on if it's really a family or not. It includes Turkic, Mongolic, and Tungusic language families. Sometimes they also add Koreanic and Japonic to them. All those languages feature many structural similarities. They are agglutinative. As a result, the words can get very long. All Altaic languages are SOV. You will always find the verb in the end no matter what. And thirdly, these languages rely heavily on particles that they put at the end of the sentence. There are particles for negation, for a question, for any type of emotional context, like excitement, pleasure, disappointment, etc. Those that believe in the Altaic theory 
claim that all these similarities are obvious proofs of genetic connection. But these skeptics say that these are just results of centuries-long co-living in the same territories and adopting each other's features. The heated debate on the Altaic family still goes on, but we can say for sure which other languages influenced Mongolian. Sanskrit and Tibetan, especially in more Buddhist vocabulary, Russian, especially for industrial vocabulary, Chinese, especially on the dialects of Inner Mongolia, and recently English, because that's what English recently does. In later years, Mongolian government has been trying to replace some of the loan words by creating native Mongolian words like Russian pivo, beer, now became sharairak, literally yellow kumis. Or when replacing Chinese words that are made of characters, Mongolians go on and translate each character separately. For example, population in Chinese is composed from the characters person and mouth, and the new Mongolian term Huna is composed of two words, each of them means exactly the same. As everywhere in the modern world, the mix of concepts and cultures also appears in arts and music, producing something very interesting. Thank you to my top tier patrons for picking Mongolian, and you too can pick the next language right here. Thank you so much for watching, and see you in our next exploration.